Everybody, my name is Alan, and on behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, it, it, coming into this time of either whenever you watch this show, it's either we're coming into the new millennium, we're coming into January 1st, 2000, or it's, or it's right after it, because the show, as, it, as most of you know, gets shot live now and goes out in this local area now, and then tapes go out all over the world and the country. And the, the, this particular show is, is shown for months and years to come. But whatever it is, we all can sense that there's a time of great change now, whether it's before the new millennium or after the new millennium or into the, into the future years ahead, that we know this is the time that we're coming into a change, a change of the human condition, a change where joy and compassion and love are the connecting points between us where whatever we think of the differences, whatever religion or whatever organization or a spiritual path that, that talks about this, the differences between us, those have to break down. We have to come into that experience where the one is. And that is true for all of us, no matter what race, religion, creed, color, age. There is an experience of one. There is an experience of the oneness, of the love, of the connectedness, of the lack of separation between us all. And that's what this time is about for us to come into that, to raise the level of consciousness into that truth. And whatever illusion we've lived under of the differences, of the separation, is coming to an end, and is coming to an end, and is coming to an end with great power and great force. So for all of us now, it's a time when our coming together has to be with a, a an enormous amount of flexibility because there is going to be an upheaval to come, in a sense, from darkness into light, from separation, in the illusion of separation into the oneness, is going to, we're going to go through changes. So for all of us, it's time we came together. It's time we came together in joy, in compassion, in love. Because we are all brothers and sisters here. We're more than brothers and sisters here. We are all parts of the whole. More than, we are all one. I mean, it's just as simple as that. And tonight, once again, Bridging Heaven and Earth is honored to have people who've come in really from, well, in this case, all over the world. I mean, I was going to say all over the country, but I realize Nova Scotia is in Canada because I'm, obviously my geography leaves something to be desired. We have Beth Bridgman, who came in from North Carolina. She's the author of an extraordinary new book, uh, Binary Fusion and the Millennium Bug, where she recognizes the 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 coming together of science and spirit and love and compassion and that coming into this new time that the vibration of compassion is the thing that can carry us through and we'll talk about what that compassion means and what that joy can mean and then we also have from Nova Scotia which is in Canada and not the United States Divya Prabha who has two extraordinary CDs out Chant to Joy and Ancient Love she's a world-renowned singer-songwriter her chanting and toning are just extraordinarily, extraordinary tools for bringing people into that experience of the one. And we're just honored to have them both with us tonight to, to allow us, if we can settle into tonight's show, to experience that connectedness. And so if we can take that vibration, one more step, one more touch into that truth, then the whole world will change. And that's what this show is about, and that's why people... Uh, Divya and, and Beth came to, to, to share their love with you and to share their connection with you. So please join me in a short meditation, settle into this show, and just try to be open to what the vibration of it, the words of it, the music of it, and just let this night take you. So please join me in a short meditation. If you don't know how to do a meditation, just kind of follow your breath, just relax, just settle into your chair, and then just be open to this show. So thank you.
Thank you. So we're going to start tonight's show with Divya doing Ancient Love. It's composed by Divya and performed by Divya and Sudama. And Sudama is obviously an old friend of ours. He's been on the show a number of times. An extraordinary musician, plays a zillion instruments as far as I could tell. So just settle in and enjoy. Thank you.
Wow, that was fantastic. Well, we're with Beth on the set. Thank you, Vivia. Thank you, Sedona. That was really beautiful. That was <laughs> nice way Very to start nice. the show. So, how did you come to write this book, Binary Fusion, The Millennium Bug? What, what bug did you get that <laughs> ran through you? Well, uh, it was interesting. We had just moved to North Carolina, and the day that we moved in, my uh, mother called and said my father was dying of cancer. And I had been on a kind of a spiritual journey of where I actually came from a very biblical background of reading the Bible in uh, great depth. And I wanted to be like Ezekiel. I wanted to understand, you know, where it says in the Bible that God told him, I'm going to take your wife today and you will not cry. I thought, ooh, you really have to know, you really have to understand to be able to do that. You know, what is beyond this existence that we know? And so I wanted to face my father's passing like that. And I actually did. And I think, I, you know, I started to really become aware through watching him cross over and everything that was going on there. And it was right after Christmas, we were actually traveling home. I said goodbye. He hadn't died yet. And it was uh, New Year's Eve and January 1st, 1998. And suddenly the whole outline for the book was coming to me. And I was writing down notes all day. And I had studied a lot of science. I'd left the Bible and started studying science for all the truth that it, you know, brought out. And so I had this whole great picture of things that could really happen. What could be that chance where I would be united again with those people who I had thought had passed on? And, but it was a few days after he died on January 3rd that I came home and started to write that I realized why 2 k was or a possible catalyst for it. And so then it really started to take on a whole different shape, and it's been quite a journey um, in realizing the potential of consciousness when we're all focused on maybe something that uh, many people have a great fear about can actually be one of the greatest opportunities we have. So, so your, your hypothesis is, you know, the Y2K, because of its universal effect or appeal or psychological effect, can really be a, a catapulting thing into the new millennium. Exactly, because like uh, Devia said in her story, something about her song, that at, when it's the darkest is when it's, you know, we're closest to the change. And I think that Y2K is such a fearful thing. And as we approach it, it's such an unknown variable to many people that what is the greatest thing that we can do at that time but be connected in our consciousness and realize that we're all on the same level playing field here. And we can't ask that we would be better off than somebody else. And so it's actually a great opportunity, I think, for us to have a shared focus of creating a greater reality and entering into that shift and that time of change and that time of love and light that I think we all feel and have desired throughout the ages. And so, and how, uh, binary fusion, why don't you describe that for people? Well, that's an interesting phrase. I, I kind of knew what it meant. I put together the books, of course, being with Y2K has a lot to do with computers and technology. And how could that be playing into um, bringing about this new age, this, uh, this new awareness in all of us? And so the binary, of course, came through that. And then the fusion is that on the edge of all science today is this really radical, provocative idea of fusion energy. And the idea that cold fusion, literally taking a little bit of input and receiving infinite output, has to be heaven. It has to be because it's tapping into absolute infinity. And so it brings down the whole idea of Einstein and relativity it goes beyond that. We're not relative in position to one another anymore. We have total abundance. And so fusion energy seems so elusive, and it actually can only be created, I believe, through a state of emotional coherency. So I, I take the leading edge idea of fusion energy and the binary of the computer and um, put it together into a different idea. And, and you wrote this as a fiction book because you thought it would be more accessible to people? Well, yes, I wrote it like a novel rather right. than nonfiction because, see, the whole point of, of fusion energy is becoming one is a state of emotional coherency. If you study emotions, you have all of these emotions at the end of the spectrum, anger and joy. And that's the symmetry in the world, in the universe, the balance. But in the center is that place that we enter when we meditate that's complete. You know, some people may call it zero point or whatever. but. It's a state, what I call, like all of our emotions operate like a laser, and that's the state of, of oneness. And when that compassion was refracted, creating the range of emotion, then you have the colors of the rainbow and emotion. And so to realize oneness is to come into a state of 
coherent emotion. And um, that's a really powerful state, which is frictionless um, in its vibrational rates and uh, what it accomplishes. And in that point of cold fusion, you have to be frictionless almost in order to create infinite energy. So you can't get emotion into a nonfiction book as easily. It has to be like a metaphor, a story, a parable. Mm -hmm. And, and so your feeling was is that in order to reach more people, to put it in a, in a more accessible format, in, in essence. But you also talked about that that, that vibration, that that center point is, mm -hmm. one could say that's joy, love, or compassion is the word you use more, right? Yes, that's true. I, I think, you know, that sometimes joy is uh, perceived as different things from different people. I think when you meditate, then you realize that joy comes from a very sacred place, mm -hmm. you know, uh, deep within us. Um, people who aren't so aware have maybe a different understanding of joy as they do of compassion. They almost think that's mercy or pity, but really compassion is basically the idea of seeing people as though they've already completely evolved. And I think that that's the greatest state, holding them in the light that, that you um, see us all coming to. And so it's, it's not a necessarily joyful state of excitement but a very knowing state of joy. So would you say that when somebody has that experience in a human body, it feels like love? Would you, I mean, because we've described it that way before. Yeah, yeah. and you can, uh, there's actually technology through a friend of mine that I've kind of gotten together with since then. Uh, Dan Winter has developed some technology where yeah. you can measure. Some people who, he hasn't been on the show, but uh, Jonathan Quinton, I think, has worked oh, with okay. Dan a lot. Yes. You know, with the, uh, the spinners, whatever he's got. He does a lot of different things, right. but yeah, you there. can basically the, show the emotion that you're feeling. And what's interesting you almost, is... You, you can actually gauge, I mean, test yes. it and have a number come out. That's right. I mean, is Point it like a mood one ring or something? Well, it is. In it's a simple sense. biofeedback device is all it really is. Mm -hmm. And you don't need it to understand that compassion spreads. And so compassion begets compassion. And the way I came to understand this is that it's actually a chemical state. See, I went into this whole quantum physics thing, and I call it becoming noble because you become like the noble element. And in the chemical table, um, the noble elements are the inert gases. And what's really interesting about them is that they are chemically stable. They don't, um, they're not chemically reactive. They don't need, an, to, they have the right amount of electrons in their outer ring. And all of the other elements in the table are chemically reactive. They have one too few or one too short. And so they're constantly moving around, creating all these change and the chaos that we kind of associate. And what I had discovered in the book was that when you meditate, then you become like the noble element. You actually take on the um, completed electron ring. Well, I knew that that wave actually spread that as, as one person becomes noble, it actually spreads to other people in a room. And so holding that theory was, why couldn't this wave spread? Why wouldn't it spread, especially around Y2K, a great time of fear when people would have to reach a state of coherent emotion? Because Why would that be? Well, the more chaotic times that we have, is that's the time you desire to become noble the most. Like my father's death would have been very, very chaotic had I not desired to reach the that The hunger place. is at a high exactly. point. Exactly. Right. It's the perfect point. It's like chemically hot water freezes faster. It's like the furthest we are away from the point, the faster we get to the point because the change can so be so So you've had rapid. like a science background in a way or did you just come to it? Because, I mean, your book and the way you're talking is like a synthesis between like spirit and science, which, you know, to me is like there is no separation. We just do exactly. that. Exactly. You know, and, exactly. And, and just put a I definition or a, a label on something and say this is different than this. And that's right. Even if you go either up or down far enough, it's all, you know, we're all from one energy. So Exactly. And actually, the next book, a lot of people wanted it more in a nonfiction format. Um, so the next book is Becoming Noble, The Power of Compassion. It's actually a template that you can apply to all the disciplines and show them that each of the disciplines has, like in psychology itself, awareness, has a pattern that's fractal, that's all of those things. But the beauty of it is compassion can solve the Millennium Book. And how would it do that? How, why, don't you just, why don't you define what you would define as the, the millennium bug and then say how compassion or that vibration could, could you know, help sure. ease us into it. Well, Y2K, you know, the idea that um, 
we made a mistake in the computer programming is, is kind of interesting because when you enter into oneness, you start to realize that there never were any mistakes, right? It was all designed to bring us to this converging point where we see oneness again. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that the people who are fear-minded believe that a mistake was made. Therefore, the fear, because it's uncertainty, something we couldn't control. When you enter into oneness, you realize that there is no mistake. So it's like computer programmers who first developed a program and created something in there that seemed to be a glitch because they didn't know it was going to because work it was that way. Because two digits and nine, nine, and where does it go from there? Right. Because they, were, they didn't have enough space, so they were trying to conserve, theoretically, that's right. the way the story exactly. goes. Right? Yeah, yeah. But you know, they, they've made lots of bugs in all their programming years, so that they've discovered that when they create a bug, they actually learn from it, and that becomes the feature of the next program. So I try to show Especially people. Especially Bill Gates who wants to keep selling right. the, <laughs> the fixes to all the programs. That's how he got to be the richest guy in America. But, well, he sells the fixes, but it's right. because he learned from the mistake. And so that really the reality is well, that people, the millennium's actually, not a people, bug. Some people, sorry to interrupt. I, I do it almost every show about eight or nine times, so it's only the first. That we're, but, uh, uh, actually, some people say he designed it that way, knowing that the bug fix was right behind it. Could now he that, have done anything different? See, uh, that's the, I don't the know. interesting thing. Probably he couldn't, but maybe other but people But the truth could. is, the millennium's not a bug. It's a feature. Now, see, it's all about we don't have to change something until we've created something that we realize we need to have changed. And so that's really what the reality is. And I think it's actually the perfect potential for us. The whole idea that Y2K, the biggest scare of Y2K is that the power goes up. If you understand the real ability that we have within ourselves, uh, in our godlike oneness state, that we have infinite energy, it's ludicrous that we would think that there would be a problem with energy. And that perfect love, savants have actually created electrical sparks in front of them from love. And so the minute we all join that electrical current, which is a wave um, that, like I borrowed from Dan, was the lo-fi wave, it's 0.618 sacred geometry, that when it spreads, literally, then it creates its own electrical current. We've never really needed these power lines. We have the ability within ourselves to create limitless energy. And so, but we're having to be forced. When the needs there will rise up, exactly. in other words. Like exactly. when an earthquake happens, people actually get along for an hour and a half and don't realize that, <laughs> exactly. you know, that we were from different countries and species and, you know, all the things we think we, right. we are, all the differences. And even when I talk to people in the mainstream is I say, now, when does your computer not work? Is it when you're frustrated? Is it when things aren't going right in your day? It's because your emotion actually sends out a wave. It, emotion comes from the ability to emote. And you actually send out a wave in the quantum physics soup here that actually interferes with the electrical current within your computer. So now, when you enter a state of coherent emotion, after you've meditated and you go to sit down at your computer, everything works beautifully because you're not sending out any waves that interrupt the electrical current that's there. And that's all we're really going to tap into, I think. And so, and how, and how, and how do people, uh, do you have tools for people to, you know, rub up against that experience more and more? I mean, you know, throughout history, that's what the spiritual paths are about, just different tools and different methods and different modalities, be it meditation or, you know, chanting right. or whatever. Uh, do you recommend any for people? Well, I think whatever, whatever you want to do to bring yourself into that state where you're, you're not riding a roller coaster is really helpful. I think the thing that I try to show in my book is that really everything was perfectly laid out to bring us back to that convergent point. So that in reality, there's probably almost nothing we have to do except to become self-aware and watch that it was all set out from the time the waves diverged into this reality. They were set on a course that would ultimately converge. And it'll happen. And everything is designed uh, chemically. Like all of science today says that there is order at the edge of chaos. Well, Y2K is one of the biggest, greatest chaotic events that we can imagine as people start to wonder, oh, man, the computers affect this. I'm going to have to go get money because the banks aren't going to have money. This is going to go down. I may not have my telephone. I may not be able to, you know, I might have to get water. 
So God forbid I can't get on the internet for I'm three telling days. you. <laughs> Email. Oh my God, my life is <laughs> over now. <laughs> So, but the greatest thing is all of science points to the fact that there's a new order that emerges. So, I mean, it's really, all of the fear isn't even to be feared because it brings us to that, that great reality. How do you, I mean, the way I would look at it is like living in the moment and there is never any, you know, I mean, how, how do you, how would you put that into your, you know, way of looking at it? I think that's exactly right. Time, space is the illusion, right? So, um, when we become self-aware, then we start to realize that time and all of this change was maybe happening all simultaneously. We don't really know. The one thing I do know is that the micro is the macro, so that lots of people are constantly having glimpses of heaven on earth, right? That reality, we've seen it different times throughout our lives. Whatever happens on a small scale eventually happens on a large scale. So. There are just opportunities. There has to become that opportunity of convergence when we all hold it at the same time. And I think the idea... Do you think there's something like the hundredth monkey theory? Do you know that one? Because you can describe it. I've probably described it eight times on the show. They're sick of me. But I mean, do you know what I mean? It's like at some point there are enough people doing it. It's like rubbing up against the magnet and then you become like exactly the Exactly right. It's critical mass. Well, right. so the, the wave I, I describe in the... In the book, when you get into the idea of the emotions, you start to see how that wave spreads. And if you follow the geometrical progression that all things were created in, I figured that's how, how it eventually had to happen. You start with two, and on the 33rd day, you've reached the population of the universe by doubling it each day. And the interesting thing was that I knew that compassion begot compassion, or it wouldn't have any charm. So... Um, the, the really wild thing was that I copyrighted the book like over, it was in July of 1998. And um, in 1999, a, co a company copyrighted this idea, this chemical idea called the octet rule that basically proves that in, this, in the um, presence of a noble element, getting back to the chemistry again, the element that has a completed electron ring that's very stable, they've noticed that other chemically reactive elements take Starts on stable. their, yes. So see, it absolutely spreads. And so that's the whole idea, the idea behind the hundredth monkey, um, critical mass, and the fact that it has to eventually trip into that. Wow. All right, I guess uh, let's just do the second Divya set uh, and just settle into that and we'll come back with Beth in a little while. Uh, we're going to do the second set, uh, the Ram Lullaby is going to be the first song, and then we're going to do Shiva Shiva uh, Shankarara, or something of that nature. <laughs> it was some Hindi thing, but... Uh, and it's going to be performed by Divya Sudama, are going to do uh, the, the Ram Lullaby, and then uh, the Shiva Shiva performance will be by uh, Divya, Divya <laughs> uh, Sudama, uh, Nancy and Doug Inglesby, Susan Brandt, and Jeffrey Litke. So, uh, whenever they're ready, please.
Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva really symbolizes the higher self, so it's a calling on, on that. Shiva
I don't know what you guys would do at home. Everybody beautiful. in the studio was, the audience, everybody was like, I don't know if you it's like, oh, the camera people could barely keep their hands on the camera. Like, it was weird oh, here, I'll tell great. you. That was great. Thank you. That was fantastic. So, so we're back on the set with Beth. Uh, so in this fear-based experience that a lot of people are going through, hopefully not too many people <laughs> watching the show or in the audience right. here, uh, there's a lot of talk about end times and the apocalypse and, you know. Right. What did you talk about? Well, about? it's kind of interesting because all of the Y2K thing is really kind of about that because technology is emerging time making, making it irrelevant. So it gives you that whole illusion and idea of ending time because you can do everything so quickly that most everything will be happening in real time. And that's really when we achieve oneness because there is no separation. So there's no... Uh, time idea between our communications and our thoughts and um, our shared ideas. So, but they see it from a total ending, you know, if time ends. And I live in North Carolina, so... Speaking of yes, where people think time right. is well and over. You know... We just got kicked off the air in Little Rock, Arkansas. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of fear about Christ's return and the end times and all of the horrible things that go with it. And so actually, though, our focus becomes our reality. And so the whole idea of the binary fusion, there's actually two types of fusion, hot and cold fusion. Um, if you're Hot fusion is like the atomic bomb, and then yeah. cold fusion is, is the one that infinite energy in a way. Right. Um, hot fusion, what they do with that is they have to first split the, um, the atom. atom to create enough energy Deep, to fuse right. the atom. So really it's like a miniature of exactly what happened in all of this experience for us, okay? We first divided the atom, we diverged the waves, creating enough energy to then basically fuse them again. And so I, I equate like the hot fusion with um, the people who are fear-minded, that it's tremendous energy from the split and the whole idea of separation, but that energy is strong enough to then bring the fusion very quickly for them. So the end result on both parties is fusion, doesn't really matter. But for them, walking this out in their reality is it was what they've expected, is what they focused on. So this whole idea of all the flooding and everything really is something they expected. But by the end of it, by the time we had four times of the water rising above on these people's homes and everything. This is in North Carolina, yeah. right. Uh -huh. I mean, you can see the tremendous change in them. You know, They're wetter. No. Well, <laughs> no, <please. laughs> that too. No. But yeah, it does bring about a right. desire change of the heart, no right. doubt about you it. Have to, I mean, you just mm. got to go with it. I mean, you know, exactly. you, can't, you can't control it. You can't really stop it. You can No. And you can no longer decide that 
people are separated based on ideologies because, see, the whole idea of going through an, an event like that breaks down all those barriers. Right. There's no rich, there's no poor. Everybody's underwater. Exactly. Yep. We weren't, thankfully. You weren't? No. No, we didn't have any water. Were you, I mean, were you like the only place, like everybody else around you? Was there, <laughs> was there some sort of like energy feel like beaming I up? I believe energy? that. <laughs> no, I do. I honestly, see, I knew that that wasn't my reality. Uh -huh. But, you know, when we moved there, you can't really tell in this area, you know, where is the floodplains? I mean, basically, you know, it's not that far to the ocean. It's very low. But, um, yeah, our portion of town didn't, you know, didn't receive much flooding. We had a lot of rain, but that was about so it. So everybody come by and thank you for that? <laughs> no, no. No. No, but you know, it does work its work. I mean, I went through mine uh, with my father's death, and had I not written the book as a result of that, see, my hardest trial was not in my father's death. I was ready for that, ready for that experience. But on the last day that I was writing the book, almost a year ago, my sister, who is a year younger than me, committed suicide. And the real challenge there was to realize that both deaths it are equal. Same. That's right. right. That's exactly right. Had I not gone through that whole process in the network of everyone that I knew who was is not there, aware. Is, is there a lot more death around you? I mean, you would be a little concerned. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great and everybody around you is just broken. I mean, so. No, no, no. I. <clears throat> We all have to go through those things, but yeah, no, but it, that was a big change for me and the power to overcome that and see that. You know, it's interesting, I mean, from, from my perspective, because, you know, we were talking before, I mean, this is the 91st show and we've had like 175 guests and, and, and you're coming from a really particular perspective. I mean, we're just like science is, you know, most of the guests on the show, science is not really the way, you know, the way they mm. got into it okay. and the, your vibration is very similar right and oh, the joy yeah, I mean you know it's interesting but I mean the way you would describe it and the way you yeah. come about it or the way you you know it's like all the spokes of the wheel and you came out at a particular spoke that this show hasn't seen as much as other spokes right so it's interesting that's us. really what I wanted to do was everything that I've ever known spiritually um, I realized that we could explain it scientifically so I thought the one thing that I do think science does is that if you can get around the jargon on a lot of different ideas that people have, then you know you find you try to find that one jargon that's a little bit easier for a lot of people to follow. And you know, since we're in a society where the left brain is so valued or has been so valued for years, it's kind of radical, isn't it, to turn that on its head and to bring it into an emotional context. Yeah, I was actually thinking as you were talking, the the vision that came to me is like to drop the heart or connect the heart and the head. You know, exactly. drop the head into the heart. Because, and, and not that they're separate, and we've said that right. a zillion times. But you know, the way we approach it, if it's not in a balance, it's, it's then it's nothing. then there's nothing. Then yeah. you're either insane or, <laughs> That's right. or, or you know something. I mean, yeah. you, know, you could describe it a lot of ways. But. And it's really interesting because you know I didn't know anybody uh, that even spoke this way when I wrote the book. I've never experienced most of the things in the book. And yet I talked about uh, different types of massage and all these experiences that I finally met people that told me they'd had these experiences. I mean, I roughly heard about them. And I could start to see maybe the science behind them. So I incorporated them into the book. But that a lot of them, you know, couldn't understand how I had, you know, come at it. Yeah, no, it's, it's, so it's an interesting thing for, like, spiritual people to, you know, it's like, you know, all the science. But, I mean, it, you know, I mean, for our viewers, I mean, you know, they could listen to the words and say, well, you know, it's not for me. But, I mean, if they experience your vibration they and the joy, up. then they that's could right. pick it up. And that's really what it's about. It is, that resonance. You know, the, yeah, the vibration it totally of it. I mean, like, in the 60s, we used to talk about, you know, the vibes of it. Right. And there really is this, I mean, you know it. I mean, that you can change the world, you know, from the top of a mountain. You yeah. don't, you know, have to do all the the external things we think of. It's just, are you vibrating yeah. love? Yeah. Are you vibrating compassion? Or however word, that harmony. That's true. And yet it was set into motion. And I, you know, there's many times that I realize that really we don't have to do anything. It was set into motion. It was We are that. Be. That's right. right. And at any point in time when we desire to be there, we're there. You know, on a small basis, on a personal basis, you know, on a large scale basis. It's really not it becomes so much a part of your your life. So do you think that that, that hundredth monkey is happening and as we move into the, the new millennium or 
as I said, people are watching the show after I moved, but during that period, like 12, 12, or whatever they're talking about. Well, you know, when I met Dan, right after I wrote the book, I didn't know anybody, um, you know, living in North Carolina with, you know, I didn't have anybody there that I could really share that whole idea with. And so I met Dan Winter because I had borrowed a, a phrase, that name, from his website. And uh, when I met, went to meet up with Dan, he said, oh, the science in your book would work because I actually kind of designed a new microchip that would overcome the millennium bug, right? I put a lot of answers in there. Cold mm. fusion, it's po it, it can happen. It's that easy. Um, they've already created it. I talked to that scientist, though, about expanding it. I said, you know, the only reason you can't get, they've created a star in a jar. I said, the only reason you can't get greater output is because the rhythm of the sound you're passing through ordinary tap water isn't an infinite rhythm. And so you can't get the infinite output without that rhythm. But they won't try that. Mm -hmm. But when I met Dan then, all of these things started to fall into place. And the ending of the book, he actually told me about this group called um, their... Uh, Oh, Earth Heart, but they're at Heartbeat 2000, and basically their their desire was to bring about through using that simple biofeedback device the whole idea of reaching critical mass, the hundredth monkey, on New Year's Eve, and so there's actually a whole group of people. New Year's Eve, December 31st, 99. Right. Yeah, actually starting around 8 a.m. I believe because that'll be the first oh, in the, bit of the new year, yeah, I saw and that it's uh, it's a big simulcast that's going on. But what I really hope will happen is that we'll, we'll transcend the idea of, you know, maybe yeah, the even one all the cables. Day, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, it's like, you know, even like that, you know, to make such a big deal about that one day is, you know, like almost feeding into the illusion, except we need to do it at this time. Right. I mean, it's because like, every t minute is infinite. Now, what's interesting, though, is that you bring up a good point, because astrologically, there's something to timing, too. And so, um, you know, this Grand Cross, are you familiar with that? I didn't know anything about that. Why but don't I you describe it? I think people have described it on the show, but not everybody watches every and, show. I and think I'm not a great astrologer, but I did know in my book that <clears throat> we would use 100% of our brain um, it, when, we, when we achieve that and that our cells would basically realign. And it's really true. They're starting to understand that through cancer research when you meditate and, and feel compassion. It changes the, the uh, message of your cells and the shape of your cells. So the Grand Cross is really intriguing because it kind of starts in August and runs to May. And actually, Y2K is like right smack dab in the middle of it. And, you know, we may not even And that's be like an astrological... Of all the planets coming into right, a, cross a cross alignment. And if you understand what that means is that it changes the electrical fields around all of the planets and all the celestial bodies, basically. And to give you an example, the sun usually emits solar waves of like a scale of 10. March last year, they were up into 60s, which never has happened before that we have any idea. So the whole energy on the earth is, is changing. changing. You know, people have come on the show and they say that, you know, what used to be in, in the temples and the Egyptian high temples, yes. that vibration is on the whole oh, earth now. Wow. So wherever you go, in a way, you're in the high temple. Yes. Ooh, that's so cool. I like that. Well, I mean, it's the, I think the... the that analogy. It used to be 9.4, some right. thing. Yeah. I am always, obviously, bad at these things, but... And now it's something else. Yeah. You know, which is, you know, vibrating at a more... Uh, a faster rate or, you know, a it's more fine rate as opposed or, to gross or something. Or sympathetic to a greater range of vibration because that's what resonance is, is that it's a, it's a vibrational rate that seems to be sympathetic to a wide range. And as you hold compassion, that's a vibrational state that opens up to the wider spectrum. So that, you know, resonance is an idea like the, the rate at which things vibrate and the tone of it almost in the idea of resonance determines whether things are un seen or unseen. So that's why when we reach that point of when we're bridging heaven and earth within ourselves, that we see people who have passed on beyond or that Atlantis rises. So really, yes, we're reaching that kind of vibrational state where all things are seen again. It's an exciting time, yes. isn't it? It's very exciting. So, I mean, have you been traveling like the country of the world, you know, book signings and things like that? I did a lot in the spring and through the start of the summer. And then our family was planning to move. And, you know, I love to talk to people. The, a lot of the traveling gets a little hard. So I decided, you know, it's not a one-person crusade. This, is, this has been a personal thing for me, too, and I enjoy the sharing. Right. Like, t tonight I'm blessed by all the people you have in your audience and singing and everything, that it's beautiful that 
we can all cross paths. So I've slowed down a bit. I do a lot more radio interviews from home. Uh -huh. and, and, and do you find that, that, that the, the mass is picking up, the critical mass, that more and more people are interested in understanding what you're talking yes, about? Yes, because I lay it on. <laughs> really, to the mainstream, I do a lot of mainstream radio when I say, you know, chaotic emotions create you know, violent weather patterns, because, you know, there's so much fear over violence in schools. The earthquake, again, another major earthquake in uh, um, Turkey. The hurricanes that we've had all over the place. Um, people are, you know, really worried about that. But it's amazing when you start to tell people, listen, um, we send out vibrations that affect the environment and basically the electromagnetic grid and everything around you on the earth and that's basically where your violent weather patterns come from and the minute we become self-aware the madness ends and you know the mainstream do, do is picking up on that. Do you think the external madness ends in that way or that it doesn't affect you the same way? See it don't, no longer, basically you reach a state I think of just attachment then, then there's no longer um, condemnation of yourself or another person who decides to experience something on the pole. You become detached from the end results so that you can see the beautiful things that happened to my sister's suicide and not see it as any different than my father's death. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, I believe they have to reach the same resonance just before they um, leave. It's actually the same thing. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times it's just time. You know, so, they've done what they need to do here. And right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when we look back on things, we'll see that everything happened to create greater compassion in right. the world. Great, yeah, greater content, good and, greater What harmony. we thought was good and bad was all the beautiful interplay of everything that well, we've created. You know, amazingly enough, the show's <laughs> over in like, <laughs> I think, 45 seconds or something like that. And before we go, I'd like, you know, obviously to thank you and Divya. And also, if anybody wants to know uh, where... Uh, Beth is going to be, where her book is available, websites, uh, Divya's CDs, everything. Just give me a call, Alan, 805-687-2053, uh, 805-687-2053, and I'll give you all the information you need. They're both all over the place, all over the world. Their CDs are available. Good night. Thank you. God bless you. Keep on watching. We do it because of the love that you feed us and because of all the guests coming in from all over. So thank you. Good night. God bless you. Good night.